Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here, BookFest. What a great day. Uh, how many of you were here for Nicole Krauss this morning? Oh, yeah. Wasn't that fabulous? What a generous writer, and the way she approached the questions was just terrific. I'm Barbara Lane. I'm the Director of Arts and Ideas here at the JCCSF. I'm going to ask you to turn off your cell phones. Be aware that you can ask questions, and we'll come to you with microphones. So this is going to be a meaty discussion. You're all... Uh, bellow scholars out there, so have your questions ready, I'm sure. And as you know, you can buy books and have them signed by our authors following this afternoon's panel. This program is made possible in part through the Toby Corrette Center for Jewish Peoplehood, Linda and Sandy Galanter, Lisa and John Pritzker, and the Ingrid Tauber Philanthropic Fund of the Jewish Community Federation. We also give thanks to our community partners who are listed in your brochure. Two upcoming programs this afternoon, right here in Cambar Hall at 2.45, Dr. Irving Yalom talking about his new novel, The Spinoza Problem, and next door in Fisher Family Hall, uh, novelist Dara Horn and book critic Josh Lampert talking about Cynthia Ozick and her role in Jewish literature, and Miss uh, Cynthia Ozick will appear via Skype for a reading and for the Q&A. 4.45 p.m., closing program, right back here, U.S. Poet Laureate Philip Levine, and there'll be a signing and dessert reception in the atrium. And that's not all. Next week, on Monday night, Word for Word, we'll uh, do a performance of Peter Orner's The Esther Stories. And on Tuesday, this incredible festival concludes with a conversation with Claude Lanzmann. Um, I also just want to take a moment and thank Stephanie Singer, the mother of BookFest, for putting together this absolutely spectacular program. And now it's my pleasure to welcome to the lectern author Peter Orner, today's moderator. Peter is the author of the Esther stories and the novels The Second Coming of Mavala Chicongo and Love and Shame and Love. He's also the editor of two books of nonfiction, Underground America, and Hope Deferred Narratives of Zimbabwean Work, uh, Zimbabwean Lives, I'm sorry, and he was here very recently interviewing Peter Godwin on Robert Mugabe and Zimbabwe, and that was a wonderful evening as well. His work has appeared in the Atlantic Monthly and the Best American Short Stories. Peter's taught at the University of Montana, at Iowa, and he's a faculty member at San Francisco State University. Read this morning's New York Times because Peter is quoted on the state of SF State's new library where you can only get to 25% of the books. Imagine that. Uh, Peter will do the honor of introducing our other guests and getting the program off the ground. Please welcome Peter Orner. So it's a great pleasure to be here to, um, to be talking uh, with two wonderful writers about uh, Saul Bellow. Uh, Joyce Carol Oates is the author of some of the most enduring fiction of our time, including national bestsellers, We Were the Mulvaney's and Blonde. She is a recipient of the National Medal of Humanities, National Book Circle, Yvonne Sandroff Lifetime Achievement Award, the National Book Award, and the Penn Malamud Award for Excellence in Short Fiction. She's a professor of humanities at Princeton University. Her most recent books include A Widow's Story, a memoir, and the story collection Give Me Your Heart, Tales of Mystery and Suspense, which I can attest is some of the most remarkable and frightening short fiction I've read in, in many, many years. Uh, appropriately for Saul Bellow, uh, Joyce Carol Oates received the Chicago Tribune's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2006. Quoting the Los Angeles Times, Oates is just a fearless writer with her brave heart and her impossibly lush and dead-on imaginative powers. Benjamin Taylor is the editor of Saul Bellow Letters. It was named one of the top 10 books of 2010 by the New York Times and listed among the best books of 2010 by the Washington Post. Taylor is also the editor of a book of essays, Into the Open, and two novels, Tales Out of School, winner of the 1996 Harold Ribolo Prize, and The Book of Getting Even, a Los Angeles Times favorite book of 2008. Taylor is a member of the graduate writing faculty of the New School in New York City, and he has a new book coming out in May called Naples Declared, a walk around the bay about, obviously, the city of Naples. It comes as no surprise, Philip Roth says, about this collection of letters by Saul Bellow, 
to find that the great novelist was a great correspondent as well. I hungrily read the book through in three nights, as though I'd stumbled upon a lost bellow masterpiece only recently unearthed. It was difficult to prepare for this discussion of Saul Bellow because when I pulled off all the shel- books off my shelf, I immediately uh, started reading as opposed to started <laughs> preparing for, for this. And, and that's what happens with Bellow. You fall into his incredibly vividly imagined and heavily populated worlds. In the words of one of my favorite writers, also Leonard Michaels, he, Michaels says that Bellow has a spontaneity of life on every single page. I have a personal relationship to Bellow. My grandfather walked the same streets and grew up on the same streets as Augie March in the 1920s of Chicago. And I never knew my grandfather very well, but through reading Bellow, I was able to get a window on his world in ways that I never would have had before. And I'm very grateful not only as a writer, but as a person to have been able to have that through Bellow. Um, He talks about uh, Chicago being that clumsy, stinking, tender city. That's my place. Um, so I'd like to uh, bring out our two guests tonight, um, Joyce Carol Oates and Benjamin Taylor. So we have much to, to talk about, and I thought one place to begin uh, would be where I just left off, and that's talk a little bit about Augie March. Um, in, in, a, in a letter uh, to Bernard Malamud, um, after the publication of Augie March, uh, he says this to Malamud. A novel like a letter should be loose, cover much ground, run swiftly, take risks of mortality and decay. I backed away from Flaubert in the direction of Walter Scott, Balzac, and Dickens. And I'd like to start with you, Joyce. And you, you have a, a wonderful essay about um, Bellow and, and his relationship to cities, Chicago and New York being most notable. And you talk about Bellow's elasti- elasticity of prose. You also say in Augie March that it's a lonely but heavily populated book. I wonder if you could just start out by talking a little bit about Augie March and, and your general relationship to Bellow's work. Well, I think Augie March was the first book of Bellows that I read, and I may have been in high school, and I was very excited because I had read classics like Faulkner and Hemingway, but Bellow was the, the writer who was living right now, and the, the novel Augie March got a lot of media attention from Time magazine and places like that, so I wasn't aware of any kind of Jewish-American literature. I basically was responding just to this book, which I probably got from the library. And I really, I love the first line. I mean, we all remember the first line of an American Chicago born. And I didn't have any idea that it was in such dis- distinction and so really um, in contrast to his earlier novels, which I hadn't read, that it was like a, an enormous breakthrough novel just filled with uh, the ver- vernacular a kind of exalted vernacular that, that Bell then made his own signature. Whereas the earlier novels, Dangling Man and The Victim, are much more restrained and, and shapely novels that were sort of symmetrically imagined. But Augie is very Russian. And of course, I didn't really know that either. As a high school student, I was just sort of relating to a wonderful, uh, it's like gusts of wind <laughs> that were very uh, energizing. And I remember Augie sort of mar- walking through the streets of Chicago. And now that I'm much, much older and look upon it as a text, I'm wondering to what degree it was a fantasy of, of Bellows that he was looking back mm-hmm. at a life he might have led mm-hmm. as Augie March, but probably didn't, as Augie March touches upon different kinds of people, in, including even the, the underworld. Isn't this wonderful character named Dingbat? <laughs> right, Dingbat. Sort of, the song. names are so are very, <laughs> really so great. But then, when I was thinking just for this program, I was thinking, I wonder if anybody's written about Studs Lonigan and Augie March, because they're both of the same era, and how completely different. As you know, James Farrow wrote these not the trilogy of of Studs Lonigan in Chicago from an Irish Catholic neighborhood and it's more or less contemporaneous with Augie March from this Jewish neighborhood. They could not be more different. 
It's, it's, has anybody mm -hmm. written on the, on the two of them? Well, it seemed it, inevitable. It, it, it's so interesting you mentioned Farrell, uh, um, uh, because uh, that was somebody Bellow instinctively looked to. Uh, and uh, um, uh, when he applied for Guggenheim, uh, uh, he, he solicited a letter of reference from, really? from, from Farrell. And uh, um, uh, he, um, he was on his way to an art that combined the demotic of the streets with um, the way uh, the, the most hyper-educated and rarefied people spoke. And right. uh, uh, the ambition was to get everything in from, from um, uh, Schopenhauer to... You know, he, he loved these things on, uh, that he heard on the streets of Chicago. Uh, uh, they said you weren't fit to live with pigs, but I stood up for you. I said you were. You know, <laughs> this, kind, this kind of thing. That's, Which is he made of all of that Belovian. Yeah, it's sort of <laughs> missing in Farrell. But I was thinking that the, expe the cultural expectations that people brought to being an American was so different. Because the Irish Catholic background, which is partly my own, uh, did not... Well, let's take the Jewish background <laughs> first. <laughs> it's a little more, more, uh, more positive. <laughs> but the, the idea... Of <laughs> The idea of Jewish immigrants, I think, was that basically the, the first generation arrives and it's very arduous and difficult and, and ambitious and so forth. But the whole idea is that they're establishing then a generational thing and that it's a vertical, that, that they, the next generation will be very well educated and they'll be professors and lawyers. And basically, it's just taken for granted, I think, in a Jewish culture. That's not true of other cultures. And the Irish Catholic culture was not, it, was not, it may have been in some quarters, but not generally. So James Farrell is speaking to the Irish Catholic uh, working class, the proletariat, who were so, um, so, I guess you could say stupid, they couldn't even see that unionizing and, and socialism might have been beneficial to them. It was sort of like communists were evil because the church had told them so. And how completely different the Studs Lonigan trilogy is from, right. from Bellow's writing. Because with Bellow, you have the high and the low, but it's poetry. Whereas with James Farrell, whom I did admire, it's very repertorial. It's, a, it's the prose is somewhat flat. The vocabulary is very plain spoken. And you go from, Bellow is just like a Mozart compared to, <laughs> to James Farrell who sort of has one drum, you know, he's, kind of beating this one drum for a thousand pages. Right. And I bet if we ask how many people have read Studs Lonegan, probably, which I won't do because that's all. <laughs> you learn as a professor not to ask questions like right. that. But, but probably not relatively few people have read the Studs Lonegan trilogy that was once very, very, very mm -hmm. famous. Mm -hmm. But then everybody has read. Everybody has read Saw Bell. And I, I guess, my, you know, to segue, because, you know, with all respect to James C. Farrell, he, he lacks the great originality that, that, that Bellow has. And Benjamin, I wonder if you could speak to, in your introduction, you talk about his undreamed of originality. It's a beautiful phrase. And I, I, I was so struck in reading the letters, um, first of all, by the labor. I mean, the, the book of letters is m about a person working all the time. And, and yet he is a gregarious person. He has, reaches out to his friends, et cetera. And in one letter to Alice Adams, he says, the only cure is to write a book. Alice Adams, the wonderful San Francisco writer. The only cure is to write a book. I have a new one on the table, and all the other misery is gone. And mm. he, he was constantly working. And I just wonder if you could speak to just his, his, his work ethic, and, but in relationship to his originality and even... Uh, well, with originality, you're, uh, you're finally dealing with a, a mystery. Mystery of uh, of genius and uh, ta talented writers uh, uh, exert themselves to to the the fullest, and then eventually they see before them a solid wall of ice that they <laughs> that they cannot sail around or or bore through. Uh, uh, geniuses don't see that wall of ice, um, and uh, um, what astounds me in Bellow uh, is the. Uh, well, I think Henry James would be a good uh, 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 comparison here. Uh, the way uh, uh, the skins he inhabits become too small for him and he sheds them and becomes uh, another kind of writer. The most dramatic moment, uh, you've mentioned the moment of, of Augie. He said his first book, Dangling Man, was his, his B.A. And, he, and his second book, uh, um, uh, um, 
the victim was his masters. Uh, but uh, uh, Augie March is not a PhD of any kind. <laughs> Augie March is one of the great uh, uh, masterworks uh, of American writing, and, and will always be so. And it ha had something to do with, um, as he would put it, building himself a new freedom. Uh, uh, this was a phrase he used later, and uh, uh, writing is freedom. I, I, I heard uh, uh, Nicol Krauss earlier say this very beautifully, more beautifully than I could. Writing is freedom, and uh, uh, the great writer is always discovering new freedom. The genius discovers new freedoms where the, the merely talented f uh, find out what they're worth and find out their limits. With that in mind, I was wondering if you could, you said you might read a little bit of Henderson, just to give people, just to, to give people a sense of the prose in your own. Yes, well, um, uh, a student at the New School where I teach uh, uh, said to me, uh, you're always saying uh, uh, Saul Bellow is great. What's so great about him? And, and uh, so uh, uh, rather than uh, resorting to a literary critical abstractions, uh, I decided just to uh, show this student a passage from near the end of Henderson, The Rain King. Uh, our hero is Eugene Henderson, and he's recalling a job he had one summer long ago on a fairground somewhere in Ontario. And his job was for the delectation of the crowd to uh, uh, ride uh, uh, in a roller coaster with a sweet, old, worn-out brown bear named Smolak. Okay, that's situation. Whatever gains I ever made were always due to love and nothing else. And as Smolak, mossy like a forest elm, and I rode together, and as he cried out at the top, beginning the bottomless rush over those skimpy yellow supports, and up once more against eternity's blue while the Canadian hicks were rejoicing underneath with red faces, all the nubble-fingered rubes, we hugged each other, the bear and I, with something greater than terror, and flew in those gilded cars. I shut my eyes in his wretched, time-abused fur. He held me in his arms and gave me comfort, and the great thing is that he didn't blame me. He had seen too much of life. And somewhere in his huge head, he had worked it out that for creatures, there is nothing that ever runs unmingled. <laughs> well, that's Saul Bellow. Yeah. I, I, uh, Henderson, one of the great vivid characters in American literature. And I, Joyce, I wanted to ask you just about, uh, about characters in general. He, he, in, in the Nobel address, Bellow says, he quotes Elizabeth Bowen. He says that... Uh, Characters um, are not, uh, f uh, the characters, they pre-exist. They're not found. They, I mean, I'm sorry. They pre I'm messing up Bella. They pre-exist and they have to be found. And if we fail to find them, the fault is ours. And he seems to have, to me, to have created some of the most vivid characters. They roll off our tongue even years and years after we've read these books. Can you talk a little bit about that for you? Yes, I think he was a genius of portraiture and that the people whom he, he met in his life, he transmogrified into to epic v visions, basically. S many of them were based on real people, mm -hmm. and he's very Joycean when we're talking about his, his influences. James Joyce's Ulysses is an enormous influence on Bello and a very positive influence. Ulysses has had a, a, a large influence on many writers, including John Updike, writers who seem disparate and mm -hmm. different. But the, uh, the, I the ideas of the Bellow novel, are, that's not really an American trait of the novel, ideas don't find their way into Scott Fitzgerald or, or Hemingway. Hemingway's very laconic and very reticent, and people don't talk and talk in long paragraphs in Hemingway. So it's, a, it's basically a European sensibility and a Joycean sensibility. And then the people whom he met in Chicago when he was, when he was a boy, if Again, if James Farrell had written about them, they would have been very small-scale punks and losers and alcoholics. Or maybe Nelson Elgren would have put them in his, his gallery of lonely people. But when Bella looks at maybe the same people, he's looking with this Joycean eye, or he's read the great books, 
He's looking with the eye of Sophocles, the eye of Shakespeare. He's taking ordinary people the way Shakespeare might have done with an elderly man who then becomes King Lear. You know, you're sort of beginning with an ordinary person and then you make, through language, you're, you're making this person extraordinary. But I brought along some, some uh, wonderful prose too. And this is the Humboldt's Gift, which is another one of the favorite novels. You laugh out loud reading some of these things. And when I met Bello, and I did not know him, I met him maybe twice in my whole life, mm -hmm. we were at dinner at the National Book Awards, and because I'm a novelist, I knew what would be just the thing to say to him. And I said that my husband and I had gone out to look, to look up the house of Humboldt, because we lived near Princeton, and he, he just face just lit up because mm -hmm. The idea that somebody would read his novel and then go driving in New Jersey <laughs> to find the place. I said it was still there, and we sort of followed his, the directions in his novel. And that's very Joycean also, where you take a place and commemorate it in prose, and then you can actually follow in the novel and get to that, to that place. So he was, he was kind of sweetly pleased to, in a, in a modest way, that we had actually gone in that trouble, and we talked about Delmar Schwartz. The reason I'm mentioning all this is that this is, Humboldt is, is the fictional version of Delmar Schwartz, a great American poet who had fallen in hard times. This is a scene in Humboldt's Gift, which is actually quite famous, and, and many of you probably know it already. Charlie Citrine sees in the New York Times an obituary of Humboldt, his old friend. And this is what he, he thinks. Now, it's all one long paragraph. His Bella had a way of writing. The, the language just seems to come up very rapidly. He's not going to stop and have paragraphs. It's, not, it's nothing like Hemingway. The Times was much stirred by Humboldt's death and gave him a double column spread. The photograph was large. For after all, Humboldt did what poets in crass America are supposed to do. He chased ruin and death even harder than he had chased women. He blew his talent and his health and reached home the grave in a dusty slide. That's very bellow. Somebody else would say he died. He died young. <laughs> no, he says, he reached home, comma, the grave, comma, in a dusty slide. He plowed himself under. That's another great line. Okay, so did Alan, Alan, Edgar Allan Poe plucked out of the Baltimore ghetto and hard crane over the side of a ship, and Jarrow fall, Randall Jarrow falling in front of a car, and poor John Berriman jumping from a bridge, who was a friend of Bellows. For some reason, this awfulness is peculiarly appreciated by business and technological America. The country is proud of its dead poets. It takes terrific satisfaction in the poet's testimony that the USA is too tough, too big, too much, too rugged, that American reality is overpowering. And to be a poet is a school thing, a skirt thing, a church thing. The weakness of the spiritual powers is proved in the childishness, madness, drunkenness, and despair of these martyrs. Orpheus moves stones and trees, but a poet can't perform a hysterectomy or send a vehicle out of the solar system. <laughs> Miracle and power no longer belong to him, so poets are loved, but loved because they just can't make it. They exist to light up the enormity of the awful tangle and justify the cynicism of those who say, if I were not such a corrupt, unfeeling bastard, creep, thief, and vulture, I couldn't get through this either. Look at these good and tender and soft men, the best of us, they succumb, poor loonies. So this I was meditating is how successful, bitter, hard-faced, and cannibalistic people exalt. And this was the attitude reflected in the picture of Humboldt at the Times chose to use. It was one of those mad, rotten, majesty pictures. It's all one with hyphenated words. Mad, rotten, majesty pictures. Spooky, humorless, glaring furiously with tight lips, mumpish cheeks, a scarred forehead, and a look of enraged, ravaged childish, childishness. This was the humble of conspiracies, accusations, and tantrums, the Belleville Hospital humble the humble of litigations, for he was litigious. The wood was made for him. He threatened many times to sue me. And it goes on and on that way. 
It's been brilliant writing. We like our poets dead. Yes. It's pretty powerful and horrible thing to think, but may be true. Um, Benjamin, can you talk a little bit? Of, I mean, you, you spent so much time with Bello, many, three years, working on these letters. And uh, could you speak to character and Humboldt and, you know, go from there in terms of what you glean from reading the letters? Well, the letters are really a, a, a look backstage, as it were. Or, or my other metaphor f for this was uh, the other side of the tapestry. Uh, uh, not the art, but uh, uh, a report on where it came from. Um, in the case of Humboldt, um, the genesis of the book is something that uh, happened one day on the streets in midtown Manhattan. He um, came face to face with his old friend and antagonist, um, Delmore Schwartz, who was in terrible shape living in a kind of a flop house in midtown, and they didn't speak. Their eyes met and they didn't mm. speak. And um, uh, I think sooner or later, everyone has this experience of coming face to face with a former friend and, uh, and in some cases not speaking. Uh, so that was uh, uh, the germ out of real life. What he does with it is, is fantastical, baroque, um, well, com uh, uh, comical, and then heartbreaking. Um, and um, um, again and again, uh, uh, reading these letters, preparing them for publication, I felt I was, um, I was uh, at, at the quick of the creative process, at, at um, uh, position one, the first stage very often, of what was going to happen imaginatively. Uh, fiction is not uh, the uh, uh, transcription of life, not at all. It's the metamorphosis of life, the overcoming of life, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's what I uh, uh, was fascinated by, uh, the metamorphoses uh, uh, of real life I into art. And as Joyce mentioned, we know for a fact that he used real people, in his, as we all do. Yes. And, and he, he, he often got attacked for that. But, but more, there's some letters that speak directly to this where he actually kind of defends himself about this. There's a particular letter from a guy named Dave Peltz. I wonder if you could just <coughs> give a little context for that. Yes. Saul Bellow spent uh, uh, um, his share of time writing letters, trying to placate angry friends or former friends, saying, how, how dare you uh, use this from my life? And, uh, uh, well, where, where do they think fiction comes from? Uh, the fiction mm -hmm. writers are, 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 are robbers and thieves and, and uh, pilferers, and, and, uh, and beware. Uh, um, because uh, little or nothing is lost on the best of them, and uh, everything is grist to the mill. But then you open the morning mail and there's a letter from a friend saying, um, uh, that happened to me, that belonged to me. I was going to write about it one day. Mm. <laughs> well, and Bello, in the, in, in the sweetest way, wrote back, saying, but you didn't. Mm. I did. <laughs> right. and, uh, and you well, could, he said. And, and he said, he, he said D didn't you like being a, a, a part of my equipment as I took <laughs> off for the moon? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> no, a lot, a lot of people... Didn't. And um, uh, he wrote a story called What Kind of Day Did You Have? Uh, transparently about his great friend uh, Harold Rosenberg, the uh, art critic. Uh, and, uh, uh, um, and Rosenberg's longtime mistress, um, uh, whose name I'm not going to say. But uh, he got a letter from her saying uh, the usual thing, the thing that all these letters say, which is, how dare you do this? Mm -hmm. How dare you invade my privacy? And, and uh, uh, he said about the woman in the story, she, uh, 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 she resembles you in nothing but beauty, my dear. Uh, <laughs> so he, he had several techniques for fending off these attacks, but there is no fending off these uh, attacks. This is what fiction writers are guilty of. Um, well, I could say also he's mythologizing people who are somewhat ordinary people and who would be forgotten. <laughs> yes. And right. they're mythologized and they're made really luminous and wonderful, like Valentine Gerbersch. Is that how you pronounce his name? Gersbach, I Gersbach, think. Gersbach, who had been Jack Ludwig in real life. <laughs> right. And Jack Ludwig in real life was known at that time. Yeah. 
<laughs> but now I think the name is really doesn't suggest anything. There's not much association. Whereas Herzog, the novel, is probably fairly immortal, and the, he's a wonderful character, probably much more interesting than the actual person. Jack, Jack Ludwig had, uh, had cuckolded Saul Bell, not to put too fine a point on it, stolen away his second wife. Um, and uh, uh, Herzog, uh, uh, um, among many other things, is a get-even book. Uh, uh, Jack Ludwig had a, a gouted leg. Uh, um, uh, Valentine Gersbach has no leg at all, yeah, just a, a, a wooden <laughs> uh, a peg. And uh, um, uh, he's described as um, when he walks, be moving up and down like a, a gondolier, Gondolary. the motion That's of a gondolier. So, so uh, uh, the the very mortal Jack Ludwig in that moment becomes immortal and becomes Absolutely. mythological and, also, and a part of literature. And very handsome. Bello talks about how handsome the man is, his hot, dark eyes, his intensity. It's a portrait that's luminous. It's not unlike portraits in, in Joyce's Ulysses. Many of the portraits in Joyce's Ulysses are based on his friends, yes. and people he knew, <coughs> and Blazes Boylan, for instance, Buck Mulligan, these people. And the real people wrote to Joyce, and one of them said, if, if you use me, you know, I won't mind if it's a work of genius. <laughs> and that was the proper attitude to take, you know, let's not mind about this if it's a work of genius. And, and you know, even Valentin Gersbach gets one of the most tender scenes in the whole yes, book. Yes, with bathing with the, the baby little girl. In the bathtub. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, so I, I think that the transcendence of anything real is what we're yes. talking about. And yes. I'm wondering in particular about Herzog, which you know, I think it was the book that when I was preparing for this, I sank back into and, yes. and couldn't stop reading and ended up, you know, moved all over again. Even the, the, the background of the book is important, but then what the book is. So I wonder if we could talk about Herzog and why it does what it does so well. Well, I, I think we like Herzog because we feel in some ways an identification with him, maybe more than with other characters. Uh, this time when I was reading Herzog, I've read it a number of times mm -hmm. and I underlined many passages. I was just struck by the beauty of the language. And Herzog has that Boluvian eye for metaphors that are so wonderful. But the role of women in the novel is different. And if it was only women in the audience, we could really talk about uh, <laughs> some of the sexism of Sabella. I mean, I don't, want to be, I don't want to be critical or any way pejorative, but a woman reads the novels a little differently from the men because the women are only in the novels to sort of illuminate the man. And at the very end of Herzog, this Ramona who does everything, she's trying so hard, it's a painful portrait. He's so condescending to this beautiful woman. Yeah. And at the end, I think the quote is, she wasn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then Bell Bellow's hero has sort of written himself out and he's not gonna write any more letters and he's sort of lying. Uh, upstairs, and a woman housekeeper is, is cleaning the house, and she's making too much noise, or she's raising some dust. And I'm reading this, I'm thinking, oh, one woman's not good enough for him, <laughs> the other woman is making too much noise, and he's going to shout down, Mrs. Thayer, you know, be quiet or something. And, and it's all so completely unconscious, as it was with, with Norman Mailer. The sexism is so unconscious that it's like innocent babies, like huge babies that are very innocent. They have no, I they have no idea that they're, that they're sexist because nobody ever actually told do you them. Think do you think Bello truly had no idea? I mean, that he, how he portrayed women in, in Well, I in don't know Bello personally. Right. He probably would have felt, he did feel that feminists were out to get him. And Philip Roth thought that feminists were out to get him, which is true. <laughs> the feminists are out to get him. And they were out to get Norman Mailer. And I mean, the feminists are sort of out to get these people. Well, why not? <laughs> after after mille, millennia, I mean, thousands and thousands of years, and it just sort of continues. This is not to say that I'm not at all indicating I don't like Bello, or I like Norman Maley, who was a friend of mine, and Roth also. It's just that they, it doesn't somehow occur to them that the portraits of the women are very condescending. Well, m most of my favorite l literature could best be described as androgynous, the novels of, uh, of Willa Cather and of 
um, Henry James, or in, uh, Marcel Proust, entirely androgynous. Mm -hmm. The imagination can inhabit yes. women as readily uh, as men. Um, no one would describe uh, 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 any of the, th the three you just mentioned that way. It's it's true, but uh, um, uh, there are, there are these other compensations, uh, depiction of m male energy, male anger. They uh, they excel. There's one thing I I, I have noticed recently. Um, uh, I've come to cherish in fiction uh, writers who can depict the way women speak to one another when no men are present. Mm. And there, are, there have been almost no male writers, except for Henry James in our tradition. Lawrence. Who, uh, Lawrence. Uh, uh, there are very few writers who've cared to do this or well, been Lawrence interested. Lawrence is brilliant. I yes. mean, he's much, much more than Henry James. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And this is, uh, 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 so this is not, this is what's not. We could make a list of uh, things that aren't in Sol Bellow and that, yeah. I, I'm, I'm getting the, the, the time out button, but I want to, before we open it up for questions, um, there's so much in these letters that, that, that shed light on him as a, as a human being, as a writer, as a father, as a husband. He was a husband a number of times, as we know. Um, but he, he had relationships with other writers that um, were very important to him. Among them, um, just I want to give a, 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 a mention to one of my favorite writers, and he rarely is he mentioned, but a man named Wright Morris, who uh, lived in this area, he was yes. originally from Nebraska, a wonderful writer that, that Bello is extremely kind to and is um, largely forgotten. Harvey Swatos, Richard Stern, he was close to, he had corresponded with Edna O'Brien, Grace Paley, William Kennedy, Louise Gluck, Alice Adams, Ralph Ellison, Gene Stafford, the list goes on and on. Among them is, is Joyce Carol Oates in, 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 the, in the book as well. You had, uh, I guess, commissioned him to, to do a, a piece for the Ontario Review. Oh, I didn't commission him. Oh. That sounds <laughs> or uh, a little bit formal. Asked him. Uh, no, we, we, my husband and I at that time started a little magazine in Ontario. It was called the Ontario Review. And I wrote to writer friends and just writers whom I didn't know, including Philip Roth, mm -hmm. whom I actually interviewed. And I wrote to Saul Bellow asking if he had anything for our magazine. I was so naive. Uh, he was a person publishing in the New Yorker and Esquire and all these great magazines, and I just wrote to him. And he sent back a wonderful self-interview that he had written. And it was just delightful. And I couldn't, I couldn't b believe it. He, just, he was so generous and so wonderful. So naturally, we accepted it immediately and uh, put it in galleys and you know, we were planning to publish it. Then we got an angry letter from his agent. And she said, what is going on here? <laughs> or, I mean, it's like the whole thing was ending and all the, the house of cards was falling down. <laughs> and I, oh no, she wanted it back. She wanted to take it back. Hmm. So I said very quickly, we didn't have email in those days. We just did these letters <laughs> that, that <laughs> went very slowly. So I wrote back and I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I would love, wish I could return it, but it's in galleys now. It's all set. It's been printed or something, which I think may have been actually true. <laughs> <laughs> but I always remember that afterward that the instinct of the author, Saw Bello, was very generous and spontaneous, right. whereas the agent was thinking, how can I make a little money out of this? Right. And, and among the other writers that, that, that Bello was close to was John Cheever. And there's a very moving letter at the end of uh, John Cheever's life that, that that Bellow sends him. I wonder if you could share that. Yes, with um, uh, Cheever o o was the author, the colleague that uh, Bellow admired most among those of his generation. And um, uh, on December 9th, 1981, after a phone call in which Cheever revealed that he was seriously ill, um, probably not going to get well, uh, uh, Bellow sat down and wrote this <clears throat> Dear John, since we spoke on the phone, I've been thinking incessantly about you. Many things might be said, but I won't say them. You can probably do without them. What I would like to tell you is this. We didn't spend much time together, but there is a significant attachment between us. I suppose it's in part because we practice the same self-taught trade. Let me try to say it better. We put our souls to the same kind of schooling. And it's this esoteric training which we have the gall under the hostile stare of exoteric America to persist in. 
that brings us together. Yes, there are other deeper sympathies, but I'm too clumsy to get at them. Just now, I can offer only what's available. <clears throat> Neither of us had much use for the superficial given of sociological origins. In your origins, there were certain advantages. You were too decent to exploit them. Mine, I suppose, were only to be overcome, as they say, and I hadn't the slightest desire to molest myself that way. I was, however, in a position to observe the advantages of the advantage, the moronic pride of wasps, southern traditionalists, etc. There wasn't a trace of it in you. You were engaged, as a writer should be, in transforming yourself. When I read your collected stories, I was moved to see the transformation taking place on the printed page. There's nothing that counts really except this transforming action of the soul. I loved you for this. I loved you anyway, but for this especially. Up and down on these rough American seas we've navigated for so many decades, we've had our bad trips too, unavoidable absurdities, dirty weather, but that doesn't count really. I've been trying to say what does count. If it isn't possible for you to come to Chicago, I will fly to New York whenever it's convenient for you. Love, Saul. Mm, that's beautiful. Can I ask him a question? Sure. Ben, I was wondering, in, in your several years of working with the Bellow letters, were there any letters that were really startling and surprising to you, and or any letters that you really did, didn't want to include because they presented the side of Bella that were um, Out of about uh, uh, 220,000 words, there were eight words that uh, the Penguin lawyers told me could not be published. Wow. So that when I said in the afterward, a minuscule portion had to be deleted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I said minuscule, I meant minuscule. The, uh, uh, the rest yeah. of it, uh, no, he, uh, he was actionable in, in, one, in, in one sentence only. Uh, but, but did anything surprise you? Any letters that were surprising? Like that letter, I think, is surprising in yeah, a way. It's yeah. so tender. Yes. No. Well, and, uh, what did surprise me is, uh, and this may relate to what we were talking about earlier, that this man, and I think most men of his generation, were socialized to prefer the company of their own sex. This does not mean they were homosexual. To the contrary, but they did prefer the company of their their own sex to such a degree that uh, um, the the dramas very often were with his uh, high school chums. The, the mm. world of Tule High School. Has, he never got over. He never got over these romantic friendships mm. with uh, these young men. Dave Peltz was mm -hmm. one. He was mm -hmm. still writing to them really? at the end of his life, and um, that yeah. did surprise me. That is interesting. Yeah. I, if there's time, I want to ask one last question about short fiction because he's, you know, he's not always known for his short fiction. Yes. But I think there's a, was a, I think a beautiful line in one of the letters where he talks about his, fic his short fiction. He says, "Among the best things I wrote were two stories, The Yellow House and The Old System, because they are not argued." Oh mm. yes, that was such a wonderful. Well, I was recently reading some of his short <coughs> stories. Leaving the Yellow House is a beautiful story, yeah. Yeah. Yes. and it's written in the style of kind of maybe Chekhovian style of that era, you would not really know that Saul Bell had written it. It doesn't have any ideas in it. Mm -hmm. It's about an elderly woman named Hattie who's an alcoholic. She has an accident with her car, and she's going to have to leave the house in which she's lived about 40 years. And she has memories of a, a lover who's gone, and her friends are all worried about her. But she is an alcoholic, and it has action in it. And I was thinking when I read the story that there's not much action in a bellow work. But here this woman has an accident with her car. It sort of stalls on a train track. And it's actually suspense, and it's dramatic. It's, it was as if he was writing out of the influence of some very different kind of uh, literary idea when he wrote that. And it's so different from the novels, it's mm -hmm. completely different from Augie March and completely different from Herzog. If he had continued that way, it's possible that we wouldn't be having this symposium. Right. Right. You know, it's possible that that way of writing, mm -hmm. while it was excellent, 
wasn't distinctive enough. Maybe it was like Jean, something Gene Jean, Jean Stafford might have written yes. that story. Well, a Western story. Um, well, the genesis of it is, is, is most interesting. He, um, uh, he, was in, he was in Reno, Nevada, for the reason everybody used to go mm -hmm. to Reno, Nevada. <laughs> and, and one bungalow away was uh, Arthur Miller there on the same errand. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and they said they liked each other, and uh, they said, uh, 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 let's, let's both write something about this landscape. Well, Bella wrote Leaving the Yellow House, and, um, um, and Miller wrote The Misfits, uh, oh, which, wow. which began as a short story. How interesting. And, and so that, that's why it's so anomalous, because he found himself uh, yeah. in the back of beyond. Uh, on, but uh, it's so good. It's a beautiful story. And looking for Mr. Green is mm -hmm. a beautiful story, and yeah. a silver dish. They're all quite beautiful. And they're somewhat Joycean, but uh, they don't have the ideas, especially not looking for Mr. Green in the, in the Yellow House. They don't have all these ideas that uh, sometimes I find are getting a, in, the, in the way of my reading of Bello now, mm -hmm. because they seem a little formulaic and perfunctory compared to the actual world and the people. How was he able to overcome you know, that of Session with detail, with 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 ideas, and 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 still drive the, these books because ultimately they are moving. In spite of, I mean, Humboldt at, at times he is you know pages and pages of this. But I, oh, I, we're we're out of time. Are we out of time? Oh, okay. Uh, just you know, I, I guess you know you know we think of him as a novel set of ideas, and yet what I come away with are the people and the, the, the yeah yes. You know, well, Mr. Samuel's planet gets a bit bogged down right. in all the mis kind of misanthropic visions of New York City. But we haven't talked about his mysticism, and maybe that will come up during the questions from the, from the audience. I, I hope someone asks. That'd be great. I, I, so we're going to open it up for questions now. So, uh, put your hand up if you have a question for any of our guests this morning. We'll start right here in the front. Um, I thank you all. It was really, really helpful. Um, <clears throat> I was just thinking about how do you coincide the ideas of all um, the way these men that you just mentioned look and write about women, and at the same time, you know, you know we really admire the way they write, but I mean, even the mention of Henry James, I can't, um, I can't imagine a woman that he wrote about that he really liked. So. <laughs> That's oh, my well. question. <laughs> Henry James liked many women, and he liked many, many of his characters. Portrait of a lady is very sympathetic. So I, I guess she wants to know how you reconcile his view of women with the fact that you really like and appreciate his writing. How? Well, if you're a woman and you're a writer and a reader, if you, if you, if you sort of reject all the misogynist writers, <laughs> You're going to have like two or three little people here, <laughs> and everybody from you know Shakespeare, Faulkner, Melville, Hemingway. Am I, D, some people say D. H. Lawrence, but I, I tend to think D. H. Lawrence was not misogynist. But some people will say he was, and feminists hate him. So there are all these great writers sort of behind the curtain here, wanting to get out, and we're just talking about androgynous and proper politically correct people. Faulkner is very misogynist, and the vi visions of women in Faulkner are just drenching with uh, this misogyny. But he's a very great writer, and I think it's just the problem that, uh, that feminist critics have had. Either you reject these people, or you just accept them as, as having a, a vision of life that's different from your own. But I'm a formalist in my own writing. I'm looking for form and beauty of structure and language, and basically that is why, that's what art is all about. Shakespeare has a lot of misogyny in, in his writings, including his great plays, King Lear and Hamlet, but you don't, you're not going to reject King Lear and Hamlet. Yes, we had a question over here. Confusing as it is, what do you see as the latent soil of the 21st century for the emergence of character? You can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> ben will answer that. <laughs> well, 
let me just have a go at it and say I think that um, fiction writers write about their own times. Even when the setting is the past, they are writing about their own times. And, and we are now condemned uh, to the 21st century <laughs> for the duration, as they used to say. And, uh, um, and uh, it's really not at all clear what it's going to be. With any luck, it'll be better than the 20th. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the young writers uh, I admire most have uh, extraordinary antennae up for uh, what's happening, what the weather is, what's, what's not yet happening that the rest of us don't know about. And I think that's, that's always been um, uh, one of the things uh, novels have been for. They've, they, um, um, John, John Updike, uh, who had a wonderful way of putting these things, said it. Uh, uh, a novel should bring the news plus, and the plus mm. was was the art, the little, the, the magic dust that gets sprinkled on the sentences that bring the news. Uh, and beyond that, I I can't uh, say. My, uh, you know, you can you can turn your your uh, uh, magic eight ball uh, up over and over again and get different answers to uh, what's coming next. Uh, um, uh, what's coming next in art, what's coming next in politics, um, uh, what's coming next in history. Uh, uh, writers are, 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 are not prophets in that sense. They're prophets in, in, in another sense, though, in, in that they, they pull out of, of the weather uh, what's there and, and can't, can't be uh, grasped without them. I just also add real quick, one of the great Bellow stories about characters directly on, it's called Zetland, a character witness, where he's pulling out of the soil of his childhood, his childhood friend, and literally goes about it, it's just a character sketch, and it's one of the most remarkable stories of his that I, that I know of. Next question's right here in the middle. Well, here's the question you wanted, Ms. Oates. Um, <laughs> Because I haven't read oh, Saul Bellow in about 30, 35 years. I bet I love the mysticism in, its, in his writing. So could you talk about that? <laughs> well, well, I would maybe let Ben Taylor talk about it more than me. But um, it's, it's very clear, maybe as early as Augie in some of the, these wonderful sentences where he's, he thinks that there's something in the human spirit that isn't just individual, but it's part of a larger collective spirit. And it's somewhat Jungian, but he'd been reading Rudolf Steiner, whom I have not read. And in the letters, what surprised me, I asked Ben what surprised him in the letters, what surprised me in the letters were a number of letters to a man, a British man named Owen Barfield, which are about Rudolf Steiner's teachings and this mysticism. Mm. And Bellow's attitude is so def deferential and so almost like a schoolboy. He's asking this master, so to speak, what the, what, what the answer is in certain things. And wasn't it Humboldt's gift he gave him to read and, and Barfield never finished it? Or yeah. He didn't say much about it. And Bellow, who had won a Nobel Prize at that point, was really hurt by that. So those letters surprised me. The mysticism was a surprise to me. Mm -hmm. um, Sol Bell had um, religious hankerings that uh, existed outside of all the traditions. <clears throat> and this is, in general, what fascinates me about him as a man. He, uh, um, he threw away all the ideologies in the course of the 1930s and 40s, and he certainly threw away the faith of the fathers, but uh, um, remained, you could say, uh, 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 spiritually gifted in some way, uh, though he was a synagogue of one. Uh, I guess that would be a, a way of putting it. Uh, so Bella uh, uh, liked being a lone wolf, and he certainly was one. He, um, he had a quarrel with modernism, but nobody would call him a traditional realist. Uh, he had a quarrel with liberalism, but uh, on close examination, he turns out to have been a very poor conservative. Uh, uh, and he um, uh, had a, a, a religious uh, longings, but uh, uh, could really not uh, uh, find any religious tradition into which uh, to uh, 
in any traditional setting in which to uh, place them. And uh, the protagonists in the novels uh, uh, r repeat some of, some of this, and the questing spirit of a, of a Herzog can finally, a man who seems to have arri arrived at a checkmate in life, uh, it's not a checkmate because there's a way out, and the way out is visionary uh, in the last pages. Uh, so, well, to say a few more words, because it's a very interesting subject because Fellow starts off in such a different way from Chicago, and then he ends up he ends up in a place that one wouldn't necessarily anticipate. But I spoke of the mythologizing and the sort of grandiloquent mm -hmm. impulse in his writing with taking ordinary people and making them into something greater. <coughs> But in Mr. Samuel's Planet, which is a relatively late novel, it's, it's quite misanthropic, and the vision of life in New York City is a vision of a kind of fallen city. And it's a lot like an apocalyptic city. It could have been, it could have been after 9-11. It was somehow a very uh, bleak and disturbing view of the streets of New York. And so Mr. Samler goes out walking around the area around Columbia University, and he sees the, he's seeing black people and people from the islands and a different culture. And now the mythologizing that had seemed very poetic and, and expansive in the early books, now to, it's not seen to my personal reading, somewhat paranoid. He's looking upon these, these different ethnic groups as representing ideas or movements and, and history, but he's looking upon them as adversarial. And Mr. Samler has a very negative view of them. He's not really, the mysticism at this point is not embracing these different people, but drawing back. So he, he felt that way about, he seemed to feel that way in his writing about people of color. Like a theft has a number, a small number of characters. One character is black, and that's the character who's a thief. And when I reviewed the novel, I said, it's really unfortunate that in this small world that Bellow couldn't somehow imagine a different way of telling that story without doing something that we would think is somewhat stereotypical. So the mythologizing, mythologizing impulse in us, when it's turned a little bit of skill, becomes paranoid and, and a little mm -hmm. bit frightening. Mm -hmm. So that's a side of Bellow we haven't talked about. Mm -hmm. I think we resolutely not wanted to look at his, his distrust of the women's movement, black power movements, uh, gay and lesbian <clears throat> movements. He seemed to be threatened. He felt threatened by literary theorists. I don't know why he felt threatened. He had won every prize there was many times. He won a Nobel Prize. Still, if there was a vision that was different from his own significantly, he would seem to feel threatened by it, and that seemed to me unfortunate. So, but that's near the end of his life rather than in, in the prime of his life. Right. He, and do the letters yeah. reflect that? Um, well, I think he was uh, astounded to discover that, that uh, uh, one, of the, one of his great friends, and the man he loved most, was, uh, was gay and also was dying of AIDS. And uh, out of this came a kind of self-revision um, uh, in the novel, the last novel Ravelstein. called Ravelstein. Oh, Ravelstein, yes, yes, Ellen Bloom. Exactly. That's a very tender portrait. Even, I mean, at San Francisco yeah. State University, he was attacked for a lot of the reasons you're talking about. In yeah. This was 1969. And so even then, he was getting it. I think the 60s sort of unraveled That was a bad a time, and, and they were very, yeah. uh, the, the hostility in audiences toward Ralph Ellison, too, yeah. by black, young, younger black people. Yes, right. So I think Saul Bella gave a, a reading or a talk somewhere in San Francisco, mm -hmm. And a lot of young people in the audience booed him, or they were disrespectful, and he left. Called him an old man. And yeah, you know, and he left. He and was I think 52. <laughs> 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 but after that, I think there was a kind of rift, and he never, he never, he didn't want to distinguish between the different degrees of, of criticism. He just sort of lumped everybody who was younger, maybe, in, in this one category. Question up. I've oftentimes heard him described as a, a novelist of ideas and sort of more in the European mold. I, I wonder if any Bellow scholars would comment on his book, which is my personal favorite, Seize the Day, which I, I feel like is his most poignant novel. And he's looking at the world from the point of view of someone who doesn't have many ideas, and he's not even an, an educated person. and he's 
sort of struggling with his own lack of self-awareness. He, he doesn't understand why the world is such an adversarial place. And to me, it was just com completely different from all of his other books. It, it was like he suddenly had this revelation that I can get very close to someone who doesn't have any ideas, and you will have so much sympathy and, and feeling for the guy. And I, I'm wondering if, if someone who's really looked at Bellow's career chronologically and how he sort of progressed could comment on Seize the Day and this, this uh, feeling that he had for Tommy Wilhelm, the, 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 the hero. <laughs> well, that, that, that's a novel we haven't we haven't talked about those first three novels because partly because Bellow himself somewhat dissociated himself from his early novels. He felt he got his voice with Augie March. He talked about the first three novels as as um, Flaubertian and then more restrained and and so forth. But Seize the Day is really moving toward another kind of Bellow, and it has a wonderful ending. I haven't read it in many years. But we really haven't we, we really haven't talked about the first three novels. Um, uh, I, I think sees the day sort of uh, uh, forecasts uh, the work of uh, his his old age, mm -hmm. the beautiful compressed uh, 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 works like uh, the Bellarosa Connection. Uh, I, I don't like the so theft any better than than you. I think the theft is the is. The, the least good of his, and a and a long story called something to remember me by. Uh, yes. uh, again, yeah. there is, uh, as you point out, the uh, what you might call the escape from ideas. But Bella was a novelist of ideas in the sense that his protagonists were often very very educated people. Herzog, for example, is a man writing a book called The Roots of Romanticism. Charlie Citrine is, is somebody for whom ideas are real. So the emotional infrastructure of ideas I is what gives the books their life, not, not uh, ideas themselves. Huh? And it's ideas, dramat uh, um, um, the bearers of ideas are, are, are the, the characters. Um, that's not the case with Tommy Wilhelm. That's not the case um, in in a number uh, of other books. But I do think he uh, he he wanted to write big books, and yet uh, what was waiting for him at the end of his career was a, a phase of writing small, perfect things. And uh, uh, he, he sees a, the day sort of uh, forecasts that. He was that, a wonderful compressor. Phase. I mean, he, he yeah. when he when he went short. Then he was wonderful. I just mentioned the actual, which is one of my favorite. It's the actual. It's exactly. a beautiful book, but of a different era of Seize the Day. But he clearly returned to that. Our last okay. question. Oh, uh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. He once addressed this this question of why he doesn't like all of the literary movements and feminism and Black Panthers or whatever. He just said, in his view, there was this prevailing Philistinism. There, there was no, there was no real uh, interest in, in, in literature or learning anything. It was, it was just the sort of desire to be loud and sign up, sign up for a, um, a movement, so to speak, but with, with no real underlying understanding. But that's certainly not true of the women's movement. I mean, very, very, very serious scholars and critics. That's what I meant by saying that Bella wasn't distinguishing between degrees of. Some people were just loud and political, but other people were very thoughtful. Uh, the women's women's uh, scholarly women have been working on these subjects for many decades now. By no means is it just some sort of passing political fancy. We're going to take the last. Sorry, we're going to have to take the last question. Sorry, last question's right here in the front. So much of this discussion uh, today is based, as is literature, biography, etc., is based on letters. In this digital age of uh, the 21st century, where hardly anyone is writing substantive letters anymore, and it's basically emails, what's going to happen to uh, the, the fate of biographies and discussions of this sort if, if you fast forward 20, 30, 40 years? Joyce, do you save your emails? Well, I don't think emails are not letters. I mean, emails can be very much cries from the heart. They, they may not be 40 pages long, but an email is a, is a communication. I've done a lot of wonderful email letters that I've received. 
haven't you? I mean, oh, there's absolutely. nothing wrong with that. But I, I have one friend who, who prints out any e email that uh, she gets I and, and likes. Of, sig of significance, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. people do that. So I want to remind you that you'll uh, have an opportunity to sign books, come back here for Irving Yalom, come back for Philip Levine. Thanks so much to all of you, and mostly thanks to our panel. Thank you. Thank you.